Hello and welcome to the next tutorial, which is the economic order quantity. Here I would like to introduce how the economic order quantity works in theory. And then I give you a short introduction, how you can implement the economic order quantity in discrete event simulation, namely in the discrete event simulator and in logic. So let me start with the assumptions of the economic order quantity. On the one hand, it is a complete deterministic model. That means we do not include and incorporate customer behavior, such as a distribution on the inter-rival times. On the other hand, um, it is assumed that the replenishment takes immediately place. So that means um, you get um, the information that the inventory is empty and then you immediately with no delay are able to replenish your model. And on the other hand, no processing time distributions are incorporated in the AOCO model, which goes hand in hand with the replenishment time. And then also a basic assumption in the AOQ model is that only one product type is assumed. Yeah? So we are not considering multiple multi-items um, or multi-product items. So just one product is assumed. And this leads us to the following slide to the cost function. So the cost function, unfortunately, only depends on the lot size. Then we have two cost blocks, the holding costs and the order costs or setup costs. So the holding costs depend on the lot size, on the half of the lot size multiplied by the period T. On the other hand, we have the order costs or the setup costs per setup. And then we have to define how often a setup during the observed period takes place, which is indicated by the demand divided by the order lot size. And then you have to multiply it by the period, by the time period. So we can clearly see that this cost function only depends on the lot size. And therefore, it is straightforward to optimize this cost function by taking the first derivative. And then uh, you can reformulate it like this, that the optimal lot size, the UQ lot size is the square root of twice the demand rate multiplied by the cost factor of the setup divided by the holding cost factor. And we can also see that we have a linear relationship of the holding costs. This is the function of the ordering costs. And if you sum both function ordering costs and holding costs up, then you get the total costs. And you can immediately see that we have here a minimum where the holding cost function and the ordering cost function crosses each other. So on the other hand, um, that means um, the EOQ is analytically easily solvable. And now we are trying to model that in discrete event simulation. Here we can immediately see the simple model. So we have a source um, which triggers the custom orders. We have a match block, which is on the one hand used for storing the open custom orders and the Q2 of the match inventory is used for the FGI. Then we have a source replenishment where the replenishment is triggered. Um, so that is of course done when the inventory goes to zero. That is the indication we need to replenish. And finally, we are going to destroy the delivered and satisfied orders in our sink. So if you have a closer look in the source, then we can see that we have defined the arrivals by the inter-rifle time with the rate one divided by the demand per period. So I'm using the a parameter for the demand per period um, and one divided by the demand per period is the inter-rifle time. And the reason why I'm not using the rate 
because the rate um, comes with an exponential distribution of the interrival time. Since we are trying to model a deterministic model, we have to use the interrival time and define it in a um, deterministic way. So now we know we are generating custom orders on a deterministic interrival time. Those custom orders arrive in the um, Q1 of the match inventory. And the important part here is that we are measuring, of course, the inventory. And in this case, I'm just using the function match inventory Q2 size. And whenever um, this um, inventory of the Q2 remains or goes to zero, then the inventory, of course, is zero. And then we would like to replenish. And that is the reason why I'm measuring also the the inventory, the physical inventory. So that means you can see here on enter um, two that I add the inventory level of Q2 to a statistic element. And I do the same when the items leave the finished goods inventory, which is again Q2. Then I have this beautiful if statement, which is responsible for triggering the replenishment. And you can see if the inventory goes to zero, then I'm starting um, the event replenishment. So this is what will happen. So we can have here a log in the replenishment. And that is an easy code. Um, I just um, um, state your source replenishment, which is this beautiful source here, please inject um, the lot size. And our lot size is defined in the queue lot size. So um, we are almost ready. Um, since uh, the UQ model optimizes or minimizes the costs, we need also a cost function. So that means we have to calculate the cost function and then we can use the optimizer built in, in Analogic to minimize total costs and to get the optimal lot size. So for calculating the costs, I'm also using um, an event. I trigger it in the end of the runtime. So I'm running it for 1000 days. And then I'm just collecting the data to formulate the overall costs. So on the one hand, I have the order costs or setup costs. So I'm counting the orders. For counting um, um, the orders, I'm using the counter count orders and multiply it with the cost factor. So the cost factor um, is here defined as a parameter and um, I multiply it with the count orders. And so the count orders are collected in the replenishment. That means um, every time when the function replenishment is um, executed, I increase the counter count orders. And I use this here uh, to multiply with the cost factor. So we have here the order costs or the setup costs. And the second um, part are the inventory costs. So that's the reason why I'm storing my inventory in the statistical elements that the inventory, the physical inventory. And then I can use the function mean to get the average inventory. I multiply it with the time, which is the thousand minutes because the event calculation um, calculate costs is triggered at 10,000 days. And then I multiply it with the holding cost factor. Um, and in the end, I divide it by the time because I'm giving the overall costs per time unit. If you don't want to have that and you want to have really the overall costs, you have to multiply the whole string here with the time again. So that's basically all we need um, for modeling. And then we can generate here the optimizing experiment. So you can go on the one hand um, to your model um, indicate you want to have a new experiment. And then um, in that case, I'm just using the PD version. So that's uh, sufficient enough. And uh, you can select the experiment optimization. Here you can copy the model time settings 
from the experiment simulation or um, you do not copy that and then you have to define it by yourself. So we have that already here. So I'm opening the optimizer. So if you click here on create default UI, then um, um, this beautiful um, animation and, and um, the parameters which are able to uh, vary and also the objective function are visualized. Um, you have to take into consideration when you run the optimizer, you will not see the main um, immediately because then all the visualization um, is not um, there because you're then finally interested in the objective function and in the optimal parameter configuration. So for optimizing, um, you have to adjust the objective function. In that case, we are going to minimize the objective function. Um, we want, um, or analogic wants, an information where the objective function is um, stored. This is in the overall costs. So if you go back, um, then I'm also delivering um, in the calculating costs um, and filling the variable overall costs. And exactly that variable is used in the optimization to get minimized. And you get um, to the main uh, by typing root dot overall costs. And then you have defined your objective function. You can set this uh, or indicate the number of iterations in the optimizer and you can um, define the variable memory space, which is used for this optimization. In the parameter setting, you can see all parameters um, which can now be changed. Um, that is one of the reasons why you have to be carefully be dif uh, to differentiate between a variable and a parameter. Mainly the idea is a parameter does not change during one simulation run. If that one is changing over um, more simulation run, then it is called an iteration. Um, and on the other hand, if you um, or if a parameter uh, a variable is changing over the simulation time, then you should use the variable. Because if it's a variable, then you do not see uh, the variables here and then you cannot change it. Yeah? So that's um, um, where we have to pay attention. And then I would like um, to optimize um, the overall costs by changing the lot size. So I set the lot size, the Q lot size from fixed to design. And then I can uh, specify the minimum and the maximum amount and the step size. So that means the first iteration is 10. The second iteration is 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and so on until we reach um, the maximum defined, which is 1000. So of course here you have to be somehow careful and you should have a pre-knowledge about um, the solution space and um, otherwise you would run too many iterations and your experiment won't finish. Here you could indicate or change the time. Um, I copied from my experiment simulation so it's again the 1000 days and then you could also indicate some constraints uh, you can also um, activate um, the randomness and the replications. Since this is a deterministic model, I just use the fixed seed um, and I'm not activating the um, replications. And if you have done that, then we can run the optimizing uh, problem in Analogic. The Java applet is generated. And then we can see already the Java applet here. We can run it. Um, you can see I'm using multiple cores. All the power of my computer is now activated. And now we see the first results. In that case, I can easily use multi cores because I'm not storing the data to an Excel interface. If you would use my introduced Excel interface, then I suggest to use to deactivate the allow parallel evaluation um, because then you would run into problems with the Excel interface and you would lose data. Yeah, so that's what's happening. So we are changing now the Q lot size. 
um, you can see the change here. You can see the um, best solution found so far. We can see here um, the status of the optimization and that takes a little bit of time. So now the optimizing um, experiment has finished. We can see now we have found the minimum um, or the best um, um, cost. We can see um, that the optimal lot size indicated by the simulation is 100. Um, the question is, is that now uh, valid? Since we have a very easy optimizing problem and I have shown you how to solve that analytically, you can now compare the analytical results with the simulation. And then you can ask yourself, why is there a difference? And there is a difference. And you have to keep in mind the analytical solution is the truth. Yeah? So the simulation is just an estimation based on the configuration um, you have chosen for the optimizer. And now your duty is to identify, are those results valid? Can I rely on that? And in that case, it is very straightforward to uh, calculate the analytic solution. Then you get the minimized costs and you also get the optimal lot size. Compare it with the simulation results. And then perhaps you discovered that I have selected here a step size of 10, um, which perhaps uh, prohibits finding the real value of the minimizing problem. And then we can also think about uh, what the time horizon we are running is influencing the solution and it is yeah so good, good luck with the eoq and the optimization